Hello, friends. My name is Kyle Tierman, and welcome to another episode of Macrodosed here on Trends of Benefits. These are long-form interviews right alongside the Microdosed episodes that are produced by Sarah Russell. So if you have a little bit more time, uh, want to dig a little bit deeper and hear some interesting interviews, that's what the Macrodosed episodes are for. Something for everyone. And this one is taking a look inside Mudwater with the head of Mud Films, Chris Keener. Chris Keener is the head of Mud Films and founder and principal of two production companies, Golden Bear and Good Fight Media. He oversaw content for outlets like National Geographic, Discovery Discovery Channel, ESPN, and the Travel Channel. Recently, he directed and executive produced the five-part docuseries We Speak Dance for Netflix and helmed an episode of the Webby Award-winning Conflict for Netflix and The Atlantic. As the creator of Golden Bear Breathwork and Lixer app, Chris facilitates transformative experiences by connecting people to the power of their breath. He conducts workshops for clients like Salesforce, Soho House, Aloe Yoga, and Penn University, while also working in prisons and with the underdeserved, uh, underserved. Excuse me. Uh, he co-created and voiced the Lixer app, the first to focus on long-form guided breath work. Chris is one of the most creative people I've ever met, and I have the pleasure of working with him here at Mudwater on a weekly basis. And for uh, for those of you guys, also, one thing I, we want to get going on this podcast are little voice memos that you send in. So if you send in a voice memo just letting us know uh, how you take your mud water, we know that people like mud water all different ways. Some people add ginger to it. Others drink it straight up. Some like it with hot water. Some like it with their own alt milk. And we want to know from you guys. Um, so uh, as a little prompt, send in a voice memo. Just try and keep it under a minute. Let us know who you are, where you like, um, how you like to, to take your mud water. And email it to podcast at mudwtr.com. And if we play it, we'll send you a free mud water mug. Just uh, remember to include your address, and uh, we'll give you a new vessel to get all of your mud in. Um, So podcast at mudwtr. And if you want a 20% discount on mud water, just type in TWB20 at checkout, and you will get 20% off your first mud water order. You can give it to a friend, um, and it's... It's pretty darn good for anyone who's looking to get off of coffee and get a healthy boost of adaptogenic mushrooms into their morning ritual. So without further ado, thank you so much for your time and attention, and please welcome to the show, Chris Keener. Ah, <laughs> nice little reset. Leading us in with the breath work. I should do that more. Yeah, so often I'll start a podcast and I'll be anxious for the first 10 minutes and it'll take me that time to settle in yeah. and I can expedite the process just yeah. by doing a few deep breaths. Yes, but don't shit all over yourself. Don't shit all over yourself. Don't shit all over Don't yourself. Don't shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Tony Robbins. Oh, that's yeah. good. That sounds like a, that sounds like a Tony Robbins. Yeah. yeah, I wake up. I I do cold plunges. I just let gratitude seep all over my body and then I bring it out, out, out into the world. Don't shit all over yourself. You can be better. Push it out. Push it out. I feel like there should be a movie where Tony Robbins is like like plays the role of a under underworld being. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like get him in some prosthetics and I feel like it'd be pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Villain. Like make him as an orc in yeah. uh, Lord of the Rings. Like I see like some big, uh, big eyebrows on him. Or uh, did you ever see the Lost Boys? Yeah. With Kiefer oh, yeah. Sutherland oh, where yeah. they turn into vampires yeah. and their foreheads get all crunched down. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking like a Ron Perlman, like uh, Hellboy character. Yeah. <laughs> but he's positive. I mean, he's good. He's the he's the force that creates transition in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. L- look deeper and there is good beneath the evil. Yeah. Those are always the most interesting superhero movies when the the villain has, you kind of identify with the villain. Absolutely. A movie's only as good as its villain, for mm. sure. And the protagonist is only as good as the 
force they oppose. So you need a strong, vi- any, any movie worth its salt has a memorable villain. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's almost a paradox though, because mm-hmm. the, the, the good guy needs the bad guy, but the bad guy needs to be not just a bad guy. Yeah. And, and in a good, and in the best movies, the bad guy will also have a, a transformation of some kind. Okay. Which they're not a they're not a steady object of evil. That's not really interesting. It's not really that relatable. Right, right. Even Thanos in the you know Avenger movies is like this very complicated, interesting being who has a point of view that you're like, wow, that's almost something I would think about. Right. And he's like, you know, so it's yeah. Well, the I've uh, read in in the classic hero's journey story, you you know the true protagonist because they're the ones that goes through the transformation. But more recently, I've started to see more narratives like Game of Thrones, where it seems like every main character in it goes through their own transformation. And it's like, it's it would be so difficult in that writer's room to try and hold all of those narrative arcs at the same time, but they make it work and it's so captivating. Yeah, for sure. It's it went, the more, it's just more relatable. I mean, the more you you sense that people are going through it, the more you're going to hook latch on to these characters. And it's troubling when you find that you're identifying with the villain and that that stirs you up a little bit. And you're right. Right. Well, I think that our culture also yearns for it right now in some ways more than ever because mainstream media lacks so much nuance. We try and make the villains out to be uncomplicated people Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't let people have their pasts. Um, and I think that it, that's a, a very human truth that we all kind of want to understand, which is why maybe we gravitate towards that. Amen. Amen. I thought that um, I thought the Joker was an exceptional movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just unpacking the, the mindset of, of a villain. I find those that movie also and and any movie that does that to be really further in advancement of humanity generally because any time i come across someone or at least i try to have the mantra when i come across someone that's inexplicably nasty to me or just has something you know they say that in in japan when someone crosses the the street in front of the car the 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 general perception of the driver, like say someone runs across the street in front of you, the general perception of the driver is oh that person must be in a hurry. Whereas in the U.S., our general perception <laughs> right. is that person is an asshole. Right, 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 right. And so there's a generosity of, uh, of you know, the collective, which which extends to someone the empathy that says, I, I imagine that they're, you know, they have something that made them this way. Right. It's situational as opposed to inherent. Yeah, there was, um, I heard once on some long forgotten podcast about this uh thought experiment you can do where you you see someone driving in a car and you have the thought oh that person's an asshole and then you take that thought back to how can i be sure that they're can i be sure the the inarguable truth can i be sure that they are an asshole and you start like winding that thought back to all the things that they could be are they needing to get to yeah (laughs) exactly (laughs) put evidence in each column yeah oh that's interesting yeah so yeah, I I mean that's that's a great thing too. Evidence, like, is this is this really true, or is this my story? It's a good approach to general, generally how you're seeing life, you know. Yeah, well, I catch myself so often making statements that are opinions rather than truths, and I can, like, when you start to notice it and delineate between those two forms of speaking. It's it's really interesting to under like start to take a closer look at the sentences coming out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just and, and you you always know when when it starts with I just feel like yeah I just feel like <laughs> I just feel like <laughs> I don't know I just kind of feel like yeah. Well, we spout a lot of opinions. We sure do. Yeah, I sure do. Yeah, um, yeah. I liked the I thought that the Joker was a great portrait of mental health in America. Mm -hmm. I know that there's, that's not an original idea. A lot of people are, you know, have kind of had that idea, but like we, we so often otherize people with mental health issues Mm. to be able to have the, the protagonist in that story kind of like go through this dark transformation, um, through a, a society that didn't 
have the space to kind of hold those mental health challenges and to kind of see what can happen. I felt like it was that one struck a chord with modern society. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I heard a, a podcast you did where you, you, you know, you mentioned just having an interaction. This might've been one of your newsletters where just having interaction with the person on the street where that was the highlight of their day, the highlight of their week that they might, you know, that you might turn to engage them instead of walking by. And that, that choice we make all the time is like, is this my responsibility? Is this part of social life, something that I'm going to engage and spend my time doing with, with kind of some awkwardness inherent in it? Like, you know, to, to engage a person that you might not normally, or someone with mental health who clearly is showing up as maybe this person's, you know, not operating at the same frequency I am, but am I willing to engage and see where this could go? And it might be awkward and I might actually be asked to help or (laughs) to to engage even further. Um, that's, uh, that's a responsibility we all have to engage that question certainly. And then, um, ideally we, we get involved to some degree. Right. Yeah. But, but we live in Venice. So this is, you know, this is a huge, there's a huge mental health problem a block away. Yeah. And a huge, you know, substance abuse problem and a huge homeless problem. And it's it's all available to engage or to walk by. Right. I was. Uh, yeah, I, I was reading uh, that book Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Mm. Great book. Super short book, too. I, I got to give my my uh, like tip my hat to a guy who who c- consolidated such a big idea into such a short book mm. to share it widely. And there's this line in it where he's talking about how um, littering is one of the ultimate forms of a fractured society because it's sort of this representation, an illustration that you are not part of this greater system, Mm. that you are this kind of atomized being and what you do doesn't matter. Mm. And I think that that you know, rather than the opposite, which is like, Hey, I'm going to go around and I'm going to pick up a few pieces of trash. That's a, it's a small act in and of itself. But I think that energetically that it represents something so much larger. And like, I believe that society is such a, we're on this kind of fragile teeter totter really between like communication and violence and like chaos and stability and like the the scope of the human experience is so vast we we really do like i do believe that we have the opportunity to live in you know a hell or a utopia depending on what we collectively create and i i also really identify with that idea of you know the um you know what is it uh you know, these small acts of kindness that do change the world over time Oh man, there's, there's so many examples of that. You know, I, I, there's, you know, social media, are we, are we putting out our trash? Are we just kind of dumping something there for that's people somehow you're thousands of people, you're thousands of followers, you're on a stage. And are you just putting something there that they, they can look at? And it's just, I don't want to deal with it. Like I, I did this thing and you check it out and you you deal with it. Right. Or, or are you giving a gift or some, some generous, you know, thing to the public space that's valuable to anyone else? It's okay to, 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 you know, need to be born witness to, I'm going to share my life. I think that's fine, but it, but an awareness that that is a public space. And then to extend that to, I, I think there's a really funny, um, way of, of showing this too, which is I, I was in Italy and I was just noticing how everyone was so well kept and well dressed. And I, I remember, you know, growing up, I was kind of dressed modestly. My father was a modest guy and didn't really dress up. And then I, I started like dressing a little better and just started like paying attention to fashion a little more. And just like, and, and, and he wants to, you know, I got in a, a discussion with him about it. He's wearing sweatpants out with a flannel shirt tucked into the sweatpants, you know? And I just, I just kind of, it all hit me why it was important to me to, to, to dress well. It was that thing that I saw in Italy, which is that when people dress well, they, you get that they're contributing to the public space. Like this is, I'm going to show up in the public space. I'm going to dignify myself as a way to dignify the, the general community. 
by looking half decent when I leave my house. And that's not to say, you know, you, you have to do it any kind of way, but just an awareness. That's that you such are. an, that's so interesting. And so these spaces, yeah. you go to, you know, the, the, the <laughs> piazzas in Florence right. and you're not going to dress in like an Eagles sweatshirt and, a, you know, <laughs> you're going to dignify the space by showing. What, what, putting, what, is, your history with the, what is your history with Sorry. the Eagles, by the way? You I mentioned just, these guys I'm from twice. Philly and I just met a guy last night who's from Philly. We were just talking about Philly and it's just hilarious. I don't know. In my head, that's like a... a an inflection point. It's like, am I going to wear Eagles clothes for the rest of my yeah. life, or am I going to change my whole outlook That's so funny. and fly? So to yeah. speak. Will I transcend? The Eagles the, would want me to. The, do. the Eagles would want me to fly. Yeah, exactly. They'd want me to transcend the team. Go birds. <laughs> Go me. I'm a bird. I should write an Eagles, like an Eagles themed an Eagles self-help bit. book. Yeah, an Eagles bit about like, it's like, yeah, it's like a comedic goodwill hunting <laughs> guy trying to get out of his Eagles fan base. Yeah, I've seen it happen. The Eagles want me to fly. <laughs> Do it for the birds. Yeah, well, I never thought about um, dressing well as a way to contribute to the public space. It's, um, but I, I do try and put on nicer clothes when I'm, um, feeling down. There you go. It really does change a lot. That's great. Yep. That's great. And there's another thing I want to say about your, uh, you know, littering, right? right. I, I see that too. And it's, it's almost unfathomable, like to see someone take something and just throw it out of their car. Like I saw a guy when I was I a couple of years ago, I saw a guy to dump a full big gulp on the side of the street. And I just took, I went over, I got out of my car and he, he was driving, you know, he's dropped it out the side of his, his window and I picked it up and I gave it to him. I said, I think you forgot this. <laughs> and he took it. The interesting thing is he took it and, and he, he kind of contritely like, he realized, I think sometimes we have to call each other out. Right. We're, we we can't let people get away with stuff like right. that. We have to show them the social rules by example, but also sometimes by, you know, stepping in, being a little uncomfortable, right. especially if you're in a position to do so. Right. I'm a big guy, you know, that, that affords me a lot of physical, um, you know, ability to do, right. to do such a thing. But yeah, I think that, that the point you just touched on is profound because we spend so much of our lives avoiding conflict, which creates further conflict down the road. Mm. And we we culturally tend to see conflict as a negative thing, even though we're addicted to it in storytelling. Mm. And there's it's we're fraught with conflict every everywhere. But to just be like, yo, hey, <laughs> hey, you forgot this. Yeah. It, I think it forces people to uh look at their actions more um more actively um there's this uh there's a, there's a great book called the power of habit by james clear yeah, have you read that. that yeah so there's a section in it where he talks about how um when pilots are taking off from the runway they need to speak aloud what they're doing as they're doing it so they need to say okay um Putting the key into the ignition. I or love it. I, I want to hear the, you. Go yeah, you want to. I, I just realized. I'm like, oh no, oh no. Because <laughs> in a podcast, you're thinking about what you're saying, and then you're kind of also thinking about where it's going, and you're like, oh shit, <laughs> this plane's not going to leave <sighs> the ground. <laughs> so, so you put your foot on the gas pedal, okay. and you start turning the not steering sure wheel, gas and then I think you put the sail up, yeah. and, and and then you Definitely. the flange. Something yeah, happens yeah, with the flange. Yeah, yes, I think that. Uh, yeah. There's there's something um, <laughs> about a, a boat. Yes, <laughs> there's a rudder. Um, I feel a rudder going, but they're forced to say, "Okay, turning the rudder to the left right now." Um, cockpit at full speed, Johnson. <laughs> but in doing so, they reduce the amount of mistakes that they make because they're forced to be take an active role in what they're doing. Mm. Like, have you ever um, thought like, oh, I don't really want sweets right now as you're reaching for the chocolate? Mm -hmm. It's almost <laughs> like, you're, like your brain has this schism in it yeah. where you're thinking like, oh, I don't really want to be doing this right now, but I'm, my, my body is moving towards the chocolate right now, right? And it's, or I 
booze is one for me. Like all the time, I'm like, I fuck, I don't want to drink. And like, as, as you're cracking it, right? <laughs> or I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking done for a month. And yeah. then Chris is like, hey, we're going to a party tonight. I'm like, I'm there. So what's the prescription? Do you say it out loud? You I say, don't want the booze. I do not want the booze. Or no, what you say is, I am having a beer right now because it forces you to get your mind in full alignment with the action mm. that you're taking. And mm-hmm. I think that by you like calling the guy out with the big gulp, mm. like he probably was not thinking, hmm, I'm going to litter right now and this is going to impact someone else's day. It's going to make my neighborhood a dirtier place to live in. I think that yeah. a lot of the, like what we attribute to nefariousness often is just negligence. Yeah. Or yeah, and it's easy to kind of uh, avoidance to to do those if that pattern of thought comes up, or if you're you know your your better angels speak into your ear that you probably shouldn't do that. We get used to tamping them down enough that you don't hear them anymore, and so to reinforce someone's <laughs> better angels, you right. might, you might say something. Yeah, and and to I think do you the idea of being more comfortable in conflict is something that's powerful mm. to practice because otherwise it, it tends to it creates this kind of pressure cooker situation yeah. for people who like don't practice that kind of like embodied power like yeah men or women like i think that there's just we aren't taught healthy conflict and conflict resolution uh i just thought of a way to do that let's do it <laughs> I, we were at the um the Future Islands show. Yeah, yeah. Right? It was an amazing so concert no. yeah. went to, first of all. And um, the I, I turned at one point and just looked at the crowd, you know, and just stood the other way, facing the other way and watching the crowd. And it's an amazing thing to do. If you're ever at a concert, I, I highly recommend turn around and just watch the faces of people. Enjoy that. It's really good for, you know, to take that in. So people having an ecstatic experience. Very, um, very heartening <laughs> and um but then i thought about the idea of turning in an elevator which sometimes happens <laughs> like turning and facing people in an elevator which is so terrifying yeah. to do, right? the whole idea that you might <laughs> yeah, do that right but i i do that sometimes you do that and i'll turn to people and just strike up a conversation i mean it's weird times because tight quarters and you know this isn't maybe the best time to do that but in the in the before times and you're like six five (laughs) yeah (laughs) totally but to see if you can just kind of just handle that right handle that confrontation of another human being and and you know right it doesn't you don't actually need to even engage linguistically with someone else it's amazing how quickly you can get uncomfortable just by italicizing your day <laughs> in one small way or another. Yeah. And it's actually a Stoic philosophy. There's a um, a Stoic named Cato who would famously wear a purple tunic around town and be laughed at to strengthen <laughs> the idea that he should only be embarrassed by things that go. he should truly be embarrassed by. Yeah. And the contribution to the public space, I would say, too, in terms of, of wearing things that are interesting or colorful or delightful that... They can kind of, again, contribute another color to the palette of life. Like there's nothing better than someone who ex- expresses themselves fully right. all the time. There's, this is like secret sauce of life. Learn who you are and become it. This is, this, is what I, this is my mantra that I repeat over and over again. Learn who you are and become it. And each day that might mean the new thing. Who am I? Wow, who am I today? And then how can I become that? How can you turn that into being? And that is like our job. That's like our contract, our soul contract. Learn who you are and become it because there's no one else that's going to do that. There's no one else that has your bones and your blood and your specific history and all those things. So the idea of aspiring to be another in some ways is is kind of the opposite of that. It's kind of the worst thing we can do. Right. Certainly to to learn from others and, and to to model people is is fine. But but you are you are the the ah infinite possibility that can come from kyle being kyle is like let's not get in the way of that right what, what would it take to draw out more of that that's damn good yeah Do and you- i think conflict's part of it. i think putting yourself up at right you know a little bit of striking fear in your own heart so you see how does kyle handle this situation mm-hmm. when i turn and face the other people in the elevator with a mirthful 
you know, disposition and body language that says I'm, I'm ge- open and generous and yeah, see what happens. Well, dude, I think that the power of uh, a, a morning routine really speaks to that because it's, it kind of centers you. Like just to give yourself even 10 minutes of like meditation or breath work in the morning, it is in many ways, it's not a selfish act because you are kind of remembering who you are so that you can engage with the world as more of you. Yeah. And if you don't have that little, like for me, it's it's like it changes day to day. If I just get up and rush out the door, I, it feels like I'm just being you know, flailing about, like <laughs> being blown with the wind, yeah. you know, with, you know, just avoiding conflict and chasing pleasure. Yeah. But to like be able to have that little time, like yeah. it feels very samurai to me. Oh, yeah. This is, you're sharpening your Kyle. Right? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> I love that. The Kyle is gleaming and ready to cut through the world. <laughs> yeah. Or play Aikido. I love that. I love the, the metaphor too of, of um, you know, this is not mine. It's it, it, the Aikido, one of these martial dispositions where you're parrying energy, you know, there's that you're moving. So if someone comes and attacks you, you're using that that energy of that person coming towards you and you're parrying it and they fall on the ground. And right. You, you've done little, but just push the energy aside. And and like, that's not that's not mine. That's not Chris. Whatever energy that is coming at me, if I know where I am and I feel grounded, I can just step aside and let the things that don't belong in my life, let them go by. I don't have to engage all of them. I don't have to confront all of them. And if I do, it's recognizing that's your deal. That's like if someone comes at you and they're, you know, just being a flailing asshole, it's like you can leave that. That's yours. That I. I don't, that's no part of mine. And so I set that aside and I keep moving with hmm. my own energy and, and feel very <laughs> un, un, untouched, unperturbed. Right. This is the middle way. You know, this is the non-attachment. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, I, it, it, it all started down. making, no, it's good, man. I'm, I'm down to go down this road. This is dope. I, I, a lot of that started making more sense to me when I started taking psychedelics mm. and and starting to like to recognize this the limitations of my view of myself as this atomized being mm. and to also like if you've ever had a dark trip like you realize that there are some energies that you don't want to engage with and they become very pronounced if you put yourself in a situation where you're on a big bag of mushrooms at a weird festival and you know it, it, to be able to further strengthen like your chris as you are going through it is it's just another way of seeing the world that i think is often overlooked but largely guiding us mhm yeah i love that you you know, mentioned the, the parts of you that there's this self transcendent experience that also often happens in the psychedelic experience, also in the breathwork experience. This is why I love breathwork, is you kind of de atomize yourself, as you say, you know, you, your ideas about who you are, we, we cling to them, cling to them. And breathwork's a great example because the way that, that I, I like to guide breathwork in, in the, um, the typical sort of ceremonies that we do are about about a half hour of heavy breathing and you've, you've done a few now <laughs> and, and, uh, they, they typically what happens is as you begin the, the breath breathing pattern, this is a very activating pattern. So you're breathing in twice out once all through the mouth, that pattern of breathing for a myriad of reasons causes all sorts of wonderful things to happen in your body and in your mind. And so you, you start off by the chatterbox of your mind and, and, Often people find it very challenging right out of the gate. This breath, this breathing pattern is difficult. Your mind's in it. You're thinking about it. You're like, this is, I don't want to do this. Oh my God, I got you know work to do. I got to get back to my email, blah, 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 blah. Chatterbox, the monkey mind, all that stuff is just going. And then around, it's like eight to 12 minutes in, depending. Sometimes it's earlier. It's almost never after that. Uh, all that starts to turn into this cloudy, fuzzy thing. And then before you know it, your version of who you are, yourself, is in some ways transcended or, or kind of dissipates and, and 
you find yourself in a new version of wait this what is this soup that i'm in here what is, what's going on here now and um I, I know that there's i know chris is still here but there's there's other availability there's an expanded sense of self here there's something else available this isn't everybody's experience but this is certainly a very common one and uh within that reshuffling there there is access to new definitions too like well i you know i used to see chris as somebody who's really like self-limiting and, and had issues with you know an ex-girlfriend or whatever and and now all of a sudden the the, the you slow your breathing you come back and and into a nice gentle meditation at the end and you're like, I don't know what just happened. It's almost like the waters rise and then reshuffle and then and then lower again. And these canals that they sh settle into are, are different than the ones that that you began with. So you, you've created new patterns of self. And I, I think the psychedelic experience for a lot of people is a similar. It's just like an expanded availability of who you are. And that can be incredibly encouraging when you've been stuck in the same vision of, of who you may be that feels limited or feels like, a, you know, stuck in the past or whatever. Hmm. So it's a monumentally encouraging experience to, to realize that the, the Chris or the Kyle, the self that you believed yourself to be may be flexible, may be changeable, may be mutable. You may be the, the captain of your soul after all, and you may be willing to sh sail into new waters and, discover new capabilities all that becomes possible it's like a lens shift it's interesting that you use the word definition because i think that i'm a words guy uh <laughs> as you know <laughs> love my words yeah love my words got your little <laughs> got my little flashcards with me yep. flashcards. Got my flashcards with me yeah um and i think that the words that we use on ourselves are very powerful oh, and yeah. and often we are using these words without speaking them aloud. And it is that kind of passive thinking, whereas like, oh, it's like stupid or, you know, unlovable or like, you know, mm. lonely or what, you know, then they, it's almost like they just flash in and out of our minds without us actually taking a good look at that flash card and seeing if we identify with it. And it's almost like a uh, breath where it gives you this new set of flash cards yeah. that you can start <laughs> yeah. building an identity off of with new words. Yeah. And some of those words are a bit more ineffable. I find like, like expansive or, or like, um, limitless or, or generous or, you know, kind there, that, that, that's what's so encouraging to me about that work. You know, the, the breath work, the, the psychedelic experiences, the, the, the self transcendent experiences, all, all the time. I mean, I, I've, I've seen thousands of people come through these breathwork experiences and I can count on one hand the number of people that had a what you might call a negative experience. And in all of those situations, without exception, through processing or, or at least they put someone back in something that needed attention in their life. So maybe it was very challenging, but it was something from their past that de that really needed attention, that was not healed, that was, and that can be very difficult for people. That can be very challenging. And indeed, that's something you might, you know, want to get help with. You might need work to work through, like a PTSD situation or something, or, or a, a sexual trauma or those kinds of things. Um, and what I, what I find so encouraging is that when we dip into that soup, that larger expansion of self, whatever that, that, other state is that we go to, we come back encouraged. We come back feeling like I'm not such a bad person. You know, this is life isn't full of rules and boundaries and, and definitions everywhere I go that when we, in, where I'm failing all the tests and I'm limited by words that suck. And it's actually like people come back and say, man, I, I really like, I had a vision of myself that I liked. I saw I saw healing with the family member that I thought there was beef still there and you can clear the beef. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you realize how much of it is in your own definition of what, you know, limits of life. So would you say that most people find a renewed sense of compassion? For sure. For sure and self-compassion would be the the leading you know, domino to fall. Huh? What do you think it is that, that makes that insight so common? I think it's our breath. 
I think it's a very, you know, the, our breath is, is this wonderful metaphor for the expansion and contraction of the universe, the cycle, the waves of life, the coming and going, the, the birth and death. It's all in there in the inhale and the exhale. And it's so much in there that we, you know, that we've named things after it all along the, the word spirit, you know, mean, meaning breath. Uh, respirare so, so we breathe in we breathe out expire expirare so we we breathe out we get rid of we expire we move on and so this idea of we have this process of living of pulling in life life stuff the spirit the stuff of life the very and that's in every language that's the pneuma of greek that's the chi that's the prana the life force pulling it in with every inhale we're welcoming life we're saying yes to it with every inhale and with every exhale we're getting rid of that stuff that no longer serves us i mean that's co2 and there's you know and and water in the bodily process and and there's very chemical things that are going on in your body as you bring in oxygen make energy and and release what no longer serves you the co2 but there's a very real i i believe thing that when we breathe well, we are living well because we are accepting the the very the process of life, which is ephemeral. And we're we're always dying a little bit, and we're always being born a little bit. And when you give yourself to that process, having never breathed the breath of the past or a breath of the future, you're breathing this one now, and you're accepting life as it is right now, and you're saying yes to it. And what is compassion, but a, an agreement? with whatever may be whatever may be right in this moment to be compassionate is to surrender to that is to surrender to it with our with others when we see them going through something and we we allow them the compassion the presence of saying i'm here with you i i'm with you as this thing happens and i'm i'm open to the mystery of what this may bring and it's compassion with ourselves when it's saying i don't need to define what I'm supposed to do next. I don't need to put shackles on what has happened before me, but I'm with me right now and I'm okay. And so this, this self-compassion that comes from the very act of taking a dignified breath, of breathing well, of saying yes, welcome, and goodbye, no thank you, or, or yes, born again, goodbye, death, I accept that I'm headed out eventually. It, it, so, so when you then ceremonialize that, or when you pay attention to it, you realize that in, in these acts of ecstatic breathing in our life, which are many, you think about working out at the gym. If you're going for it on the treadmill, what's happening when you're with your breath? Your breath is moving. When you're surfing, right? When you're charging out, like ecstatic things are happening in your breath. And these are the things we love, right? When you're dancing around a fire, when you're beating on a drum, when you're these, these ecstatic human experiences all have in common that our breath is moving in a way that is very invigorating. And so when we, when we channel that ceremonially, when we, when we engage in breath work or we work with our breath, we have the ability to kind of reverse engineer that ecstatic experience and be really present in life and find that, that those moments of, of true deep compassion and presence. Yeah, I think that surfing big waves is largely an experience of breath control. Tell me more. Oh, I, th- I think that the, a, a predominant feeling out there in waves that are scary is um, trying to take control of your breath in a situation where it's trying to get away from you again and again. I I find that that's a really consistent that, that is like on the most specific and micro level, the challenge that you're up against again and again and again out surfing, you know, big, scary waves. And, um, I find that doing some breath work on the beach before going out and then, breathing through my nose when I'm in the lineup to try and keep my heart rate as low as possible are two very consistent practices that um, I mean, allow me to kind of yeah d- derive those the most joy out of those experiences and 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 really like the most um, I don't know 
I just hadn't I hadn't thought about how it very much comes back to the breath. So this is yeah. something as a as a breathwork guide that I hear all the time. And and yeah, I was talking to my cousin who's a professional tennis player. Right. And he, I asked him, "What's the thing that you know?" Not fishing. I said, "What what is the thing that you know you you." find to be the best the thing that you teach people all the time about tennis right like what is the number one and he had this like aha and he's like i teach him how to breathe right and then i've heard that from athletes and in many genres and it's true it really does come back to your breath and breath control i think we're learning a lot more about that now as a society we're hearing a lot more of research come back about the breath and 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 i think that you know what you're saying about calming your breath or or placing yourself in a position of readiness that's that's very much the uh, you know i spoke a little bit about ecstatic forms of breath work but there's also you know the daily breath work that i do as you is very calming is very much a a breath work to set yourself up for a world of unknowns right this idea that you can control what you can because the world's coming at you and in surfing certainly that's the case by the way i've seen you like i'm, I'm picturing you dropping in we went out at sunset on like <laughs> double overhead day i was peeing my <laughs> my board shorts and kyle's there I look over kyle's like got this bonsai face on him <laughs> dropping into some massive tube it's just amazing watching you surf man oh thanks I, no it's i just uh yeah it's it's just interesting i think how much of like any intense situation really whether it's like a comedian going on stage or someone jumping out of a plane skydiving or a tennis uh, or someone playing tennis in a big match, like I, I do think that often the differentiator is breath control, mm -hmm. which gives way to presence, which allows you to perform at your peak in that moment. Yeah, that is definitely the 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 chain of command. Right. Yeah. So, so you, I mean, you've kind of how you have a very storied life, and it goes, you know, from filmmaking to breath work and it's taken you all around the world did did filmmaking come first and what's what's like the timeline of how these two seemingly disconnected um career paths converged <laughs> yeah i mean so i i think that the idea that i would become a breath work guide first of all what the hell is that 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 wasn't certainly a thing um i mean it you know a, a yoga teacher, someone who teaches pranayama certainly is, but the, the specific categorization of breathwork guide was not around, you know, when I was coming up in Philly, but uh, we were making movies all the time. So I've always been a, a, a guy who would make movies with my buddies and stuff and then started traveling young. Um, there, to, to be honest, like the, the way that the breathwork comes in filmmaking is all about storytelling right and so and and i think a big part of being an, an artist or filmmaker is having life experience that you want to you know share or talk about and and so I, I definitely got on a binge of of life experience right and and and, and trying to get as much of that as possible traveling i know. once i once heard someone I think Ryan Holiday does the Daily Stoic. He said uh, the best way to become a great writer is to have an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's certainly true with most of the filmmakers I know. Um, and, and but then I also had this like, my mother is a hospice chaplain, hmm. and so we we lost. I lost a sister early in life, and that colored my childhood very much. So there was this um, this loss, this very heavy loss. And, and it informed, you know, my whole family dynamic and that. But there was also, as part of that, this awareness, I think, of death, really, truly, that there was, death was always nearby. And, and my mom found her, her way into the spiritual arts, leaving the Catholic Church behind because they didn't really support her when, when she was going through the divorce from my father which happened as a result of the child's loss. Oh, wow. So there was this, this whole, all that is to say, this big, this big pile of loss and processing it uh, led my mom to, to, you know, this sort of new age spiritual path. And as a result of that, I was in, you know, breathing in sweat lodges when I was 14 years old and, and, and kind of going on this other alt path, alt spiritual path with her and um, learning a bit about that. How old are you when your sister passed? I was two. Oh, wow. I was a little guy. Yeah. 
but it's interesting to think about that because here here i was two years old the center of the world right that everything's about you when you're two as it should be you know you can't really see outside of yourself and all of a sudden everyone around me is sad right and so clearly that's my fault right right right, right. <laughs> so this becomes my central my central journey is to unpack that you know throughout my life i need to please everyone and, and hopefully everyone's okay and i mean so the the shadow of that is you know really being down on myself if anyone in the room's not happy and i think the the genius of that is is being able to guide people or or, or extend myself empathetically to a group of people and so that's where the breath work really comes in. You know, it's all these life stories, they all tie together. So sure. The, and especially that early on when your your brain's developing all its very new neural pathways, like so often that is the, the more science that comes out, it's like it's what what happened one to five. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. And how what trajectory did that set you on? And and as you say, there is there's two sides to every coin, right? So there there is maybe the the difficulty of wanting to be a people pleaser, but then there is also the genius of empathy mm. that can come from that experience. So it's cool that you've articulated that. Yeah, I I, I think uh, it's it took a while for it all to to crystallize into whatever form it is now, and I'm sure it'll change. But you know, when I look back, it's interesting to to think about these these themes that are always there. So I, I was making films, but for instance, I went to Guatemala. And I went and worked in a Christian orphanage for a couple, for about six months. And that's where I learned Spanish and kind of, you know, got thrown into the mix in this Christian orphanage. There's a friend of mine's dad who ran this orphanage. And and I went down there not as a Christian, but open minded to to whatever was happening there. And what I found was this beautiful extension of people going there to help where no one else was. Hmm. So um, I, these people these Christian missionaries were providing very basic sustenance for kids who were, you know, coming from very hard situations on the streets of Guatemala city and taking them and giving them food, giving them, um, you know, really a, a path to, to life. And the contingency of that was that they would be sort of baked in the Christian church and that they would be steeped in Christianity the whole time. And there was no, this without that. So they would, they couldn't stay there if they, if they didn't remain Christian. So this was, this was something that kind of rubbed me. And I thought, you know, this is, this doesn't feel right holistically to be here, but it's, I, I see that there's help being done, but there's no, there's no like real empathy in this, the way that they're, th these missionaries are extending themselves into the lives of these children. They're just placing their kind of beliefs over the kids and it became super problematic to the degree that I ended up making a film about it. So I went back uh, 10 years later with 16 people and made a film about a missionary who goes to Guatemala and while he's there sort of gets turned, goes down and he's going down to language school in the, in the city every day and walks into this dark bar and meets these other Guatemalan people that are very intriguing and ends up kind of leaving his missionary behind and going off into the hills. And so, so this, this has been kind of a theme in my life of like the, the spiritual path overlapping with the creative path. And then how can that be expressed in a way that's inclusive and feels like there's not just one group that gets it. And breathwork, I think, is the ultimate culmination of that because it's, I feel like I can speak to anyone. You can bring anyone into a breathwork class and, and what they really experience is a vision of themselves. Like they really get to go in and explore themselves. There's no prerequisite for that. There's no boundaries to that. There's, it's just, uh, it's an is, -na. it's a doing. It's not a thinking, it's not a believing, it's a doing. You breathe in this certain way, you have an experience. And what, what pops out the other side is fantastically interesting. Hmm. So long way of saying my artistic, like my creative career and this like spiritual yearning to for inclusivity, I think have always been the two driving forces right. have you always been drawn to stories with paradox i think so yeah because it's funny yeah like to me it's funny when people are you know their own worst enemy or when when life is you know i mean that paradox of these people that were 
they're to help yeah but also, but also so problematic in some quid, pro quo, totally. quid pro quo or yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> i think that it, paradox is so fascinating and such a great it's just such an honest depiction of so much of the world in emptiness we find fullness i mean there's a paradox that happens literally in in in, in the breathwork experience so if you just take a huge deep breath let's breathe take a big deep breath more more exhale it all and then we're just going to hold empty here for a minute and in that emptiness that empty place all is possible there's like this this possibility that comes from emptiness from the beginning and I think that in itself is a paradox. Like we go to the quiet place where all becomes full. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a powerful prism with which to see the world is through paradox. And I think that that is where g good storytelling starts to happen. Um, and it's also where mat maturity and adulthood occur, uh, I did a lot of environmental short films early on through my teens and they were excruciatingly earnest and <laughs> and um there was a lot of advocacy in them. Yeah. And I I look back on them, you know, through squinted eyes with a hand over my my forehead because I now see that I could have made the exact opposite film. And it would also be true, <laughs> you know. For example, I, um, you know, I did a uh, a doc about um, the GMO protests in Hawaii that were big in the media, maybe seven or seven years ago or so, because every genetically engineered seed that is sold in America at one point or another touched the islands of Hawaii. Um, it's the Genetic, genetic engineering, like capital of the world, where they do a lot of the testing there. And a lot of that testing is um, do the GMOs largely exist, genetic engineering exists so that crops can withstand heavier amounts of pesticides, so that a company can spray the crop and then the insects die, but the crop does not die. Mm. And I was, you know, this lefty kid from Santa Cruz who was, uh, you know, part of. Um, the, the surf world, which was very much opposed to GMOs, they're big and scary and, you know, Monsanto is the devil. And I did a doc about explaining GMOs in a purely negative light and, you know, interviewed Kelly Slater and Dustin Barca and these pro surfers that were very much against it. And I remember there was one comment after I, I released the film. You know, there's always just one comment that gets you because oh, it's yeah. fucking true. Yeah. And it said, uh, Kyle Tierman makes GMO uh, film, doesn't interview one farmer. <laughs> oh. And I was like, gotcha. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> fucking gotcha, right? Because there is the whole other story of, of farmers needing to use genetically engineered crops for more profit or, you know, the, this dynamic between the farmers and the companies that's very interesting. And there's a whole, no, there's a whole other story there that I didn't even explore. Mm -hmm. And that's not to, I, I still think that the world needs more small organic farms. I do think that food diversity and, and food sovereignty is the solution. It's, it's not about just continuing to condense the, amount of companies that own more and more of the world's food. I think that's a recipe for disaster, but to not even explore a more nuanced view of the issue felt, I mean, to me now feels very childish. And it was because I was, you know, a child when I was doing <laughs> it. Right? Um, and the world gets so much more interesting when you start acknowledging paradox. Complexity is hard. Yeah. It's hard to reckon with, to wrestle with. I guess the question then becomes, how do you 
acknowledge complexity and explore that while not falling into moral relativism, which I think is a very dangerous mm. concept where you just, ah, you know, like, the, hey, you know, the Muslim world wants to put, you know, make sure that women can't have education and will kill them if they don't um, want to wear hijabs. Like, uh, let's, who am I to judge? Right. Yeah. And, and I think that that is an extremely scary path if you can't actually cast more, any form of moral judgment from, you know, the macro to the micro of the guy throwing uh, his big gulp out the side of <laughs> the car. Yeah. Right. So squaring those two, I think, is a, a path that is also very interesting. Yeah. I think that we've been given some some guideposts in that regard and in, in, in the way that we if we are clear, if we're sort of like clear vessels with ourselves, and we, we actually observe clearly what what do what feels good and what doesn't. I think more often than not, what feels good is probably a way to navigate. And like truly, does it feel good to throw that big gulp out the window? How does that feel? Hmm. I mean, it might feel easy, but it doesn't it's not it doesn't feel fulfilling, I would think. So getting super clear in, in yourself and, and navigating through truly how you feel, I think is one way to do that. And the other is like arguments, you know, equal, equal voice doesn't mean, you know, if two people are having a discussion, those, the one who comes with more evidence should be weighted more. Hmm, you know, right, right, right. Like both can have a, a spot at the podium, but also like, we should be weighing evidence. It's not relative. It's actually like, yes, let's give full say to these discussions and then let's like, let's actually weigh the evidence that's being brought to the table. So, right. Evidence and expertise. And expertise yeah. as well, <laughs> which is, which probably five factors into the evidence pile. Right? right. So it's like, you know, evidenced by this man's 16 years at Stanford or this woman's, you know, yeah. astronaut. Status. Right. <laughs> I remember I, uh, I, Pretty recently after you and I first met and I was I was talking about another person who who works with us at, at Mudwater, Elizabeth, and I was complimenting her veracity. Um, she's very accurate and very fastidious with facts. Um, and she works as as our managing editor. And you're like, man, I fucking appreciate that so much. She's amazing. And I was like, I'm going to like this guy. <laughs> he has a respect for facts. Yeah. We care a lot oh, about facts. Yeah. Which is interesting as a breathwork guide. You know, it just, it's, it is a, um, you know, there's a lot of be, being in this kind of wellness sphere. You know, I just said something. This is going to be a paradox too, right? I just said like navigate through your own feelings, but also fuck your feelings. Like right. also, also there's a world out there that, that must be factored in and that we have to pay attention. We're not islands. We are, you know, let me live in a house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. Let us, let us care for each other. Let us not isolate and say my journey to self, you know, discovery is only internal and only will be, that's nothing unless you, you know, as Ram Dass says, spend a weekend with your family, like see how enlightened right. you are. Right. So with that is our job is to constantly go within to you know, to to discover who we are and then become it. But the becoming it involves other people. It involves putting your opinions up against others and being wrong forty nine percent of the time, <laughs> probably. Right. You know, I, that's a good ratio. Right. Uh, maybe it's a lot more than that. Do you do, have you? I mean, you've clearly developed a, a disposition that's very fun to talk to like having this podcast with you is such a blast because we're kind of exploring like we're it's a little bit like hey i know this but so clearly don't know everything and there's just this kind of like wow isn't that interesting like sort of orientation towards life that makes hanging with you really fun because yeah. there's not the philadelphia eagles taught me that <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> wow <laughs> we lost yeah <laughs> oh that's interesting yeah, what is wow. there to learn from this experience oh, man right yeah it's cool it's uh it's a great orientation to to have i mean do you have a this might be too obtuse of a question but to like do you have a process when you're trying to work out some problem that you have in your life where you're 
where you both are checking in with your feelings and you're also engaging the outside world, engaging evidence and expertise. Do you have like some kind of process that you will move through? Because I often meet people who are on one side of that or the other. Like they are, they're, they're, they love science so much. They're kind of dogmatic about it and don't, maybe that's not the best example, but like they don't really check in with themselves. There's a kind of, um, a hard, they've they've kind of hardened in their own feelings, yeah. and they're and they're hyper analytical about the way that they're making decisions and moving through life. And then there are people who won't get out of bed if Mercury's in retrograde. <laughs> yeah. So try. I mean, triangulate it was is one one thing I think is fun. I was just talking to someone last night about this. You tri- I like triangulating things. So to, for for instance, COVID is a great example. Where do I get my information? Now, this is a freaking morass of information. Right. God, it's so hard to navigate. Where do I get good information from? I, I choose points of triangulation that I think are really, you know, diverse and also trustworthy in my mind. One of whom on COVID is my sister, Colleen, who happens to be work in, in a hospital in Brooklyn and has through all of COVID. And that's a good piece of information. She's seeing the front lines. She's a healthcare provider. Like to her opinion in, in my head, if I'm not if I'm not factoring that in very, very, very highly, then I'm I'm missing an opportunity to learn. Um and then I would also pick, you know, I might pick as a as a as a COVID source Dr. Fauci, the guy who's like the government head who's talking about. COVID. And that's probably a good person to listen to. You might be critical or you might have Christian, but certainly in the triangle, like that's a good point for me. And then maybe a third one just to like throw, throw a monkey wrench. It's like Kyle, cause he's a surfer, you know? And it's like, he surfs, he surfs, <laughs> right. he surfs pretty well, you know? And it's like, he should know about COVID. Am I right? Right. right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Maybe a third piece of information is, is like, you know, Someone in the in the in the wellness sector who's very much decides that, you know, that our our immunity has to do with the way that we treat our bodies and treat our our minds and our mindset and eating well and and immunity has to do with that. And which is to be factored in. I have a lot of skepticism about, you know, the depth of that, that vigor, that intellectual vigor there. But also that is, I also believe that science has always been wrong. And that's the whole point. It evolves. That's so science proves itself wrong again. again. Right. And I love science. And I think that that's, you know. Right. Well, you probably love it because it's open to iteration. A hundred percent. Right. Any, any um, belief system that is not open to iteration. Yeah. Anything trying to disprove itself. I'm kind of, I'm kind of down down with. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of what I'm trying to do. Right. Like everything I've just said, just throw it out the window. It may be wrong, but I'm tr- like we're trying to figure life out. We're wrestling with it. That's dope. That's I'm trying the approach, to man. trying to prove myself wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's why not? good. I unless like that I'm, a lot. unless I'm onto something that's kind of fun. Yeah, like I don't want to prove myself wrong. That it's awesome to go and you know get a, a back rub once a week. I think that it makes uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm very dogmatic. I'm, pretty, pretty, I'm very dogmatic in my time massages every week. That's right. Her name is Linda, and she walks on my back. She's she's the even best. if I found out that it took ten years off my life, I would still do it. <laughs> I would still do it. Nothing like a Thai massage. I wanted, you know, what I want to be when I grow up, massage critic. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to invent the category. That's all I ever wanted. That's so good. Yeah. Then Yelp came around and just went. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. You know, it'd be fun to be a star on Yelp, where you're like a star reviewer. Dude, they why don't those, they? Right? I don't think so, I but they should yeah. have that. I mean, they have. You know, it's like a YouTube star who is testing products, and right. a lot of people make careers out of being trusted sources. There's <laughs> there's food critics, but well, yeah, why don't they just have the Massage critic. Well, it's crazy how quickly you can make a career off of just being a source of truth. Mm. Like if you really look at, if you look at um, Tim Ferriss, for example, mm-hmm. it's like a, most of the work that he's doing isn't a, original. And I don't say that because he's not an original guy, but he's kind of a conduit for other people, mm-hmm. and and his whole power is um, sifting through and 
and finding what is true and bringing things that are useful into the world. Like, you know, if you listen to one of his podcasts, it's going to be filled with useful stuff. Mm. Um, and I think that there's something, it's kind of just, it's amazing that like that, that work of like being a, a fact checker and then um, condensing information into something that's palatable, you can make a career off of very quickly. You yeah. don't actually need to be producing your own stuff all the time. Yeah. And, you know, Tim Ferriss is that amazing conduit for information. That is Tim Ferriss. He's, he's been that all along for our work week on. And, you know, he's just, he, that is Tim Ferriss in essence. And, and what I would say in, you know, getting back to this idea of learn who you are and become it. Um, when you, when you do learn who you are and when you really can, can know that like, for me, I'm the guy who's like entertaining and inclusive. And that applies to film, that applies to breath work, that applies to, you know, and also absorbed in the mystery of like, what are we doing here? What mm. is this fucking wild life that we're living? And, and then if I become that, the work of me is becoming that in everything I do. And what happens is you become unimaginably powerful, I think. This is my theory. Mm. But Lady Gaga is Lady Gaga is Lady Gaga. Everywhere she goes, in every situation, she is authentically that whatever that is and she shows you who she is and because of that she becomes incredibly powerful now the controversial thing i would say is i think also donald trump is donald trump is donald trump or um you know unfortunately michael jackson is michael jackson he told you who he was all along you know right <laughs> i'm bad i'm, I'm bad, bad right, you know, right? Um, I, 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 but really that that if you look at at what what it what consolidates power for good or for bad just just energy what consolidates energy is being like oneself like authentically unfortunately i think you know some people are can be festering wounds at times right well maybe they don't necessarily have the um they haven't done the work on ethics to decide what kind of energy they want to put into the world they just decide that they want to put energy into the world and it can be very seductive to put dark energy into the world. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So let's go back into the woo land. Yeah, the crazy. Yeah, let's get in there. Yeah. I don't even, I hate, we need a better word yeah. for that spiritual world. Here, here's a great definition of spirituality because this is something that always troubled me. Uh, dealing with matters of ultimate concern. Oh, I love that. Yeah, because people would always say I'm spiritual. I'm not yeah, religious. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, what I does that mean? It's yeah, like, I need, we need a better. I need some better flashcards what? to to for those for the definitions of spirituality. Yeah. So dealing with matters of ultimate concern. Yeah, I love that. Speaks to me. I fucking love that. I'm gonna start talking about because it, it delegitimizes it when you like with the other more popular words that we use, and it kind of and you almost say it sheepishly, mm -hmm. which is like, hey, we've all been. We've all been there before. Most people, you know, most people who are uh, have a modicum of curiosity in their lives and, you know, have experienced how small they feel at the feet of nature, you know, or have fallen in love or fallen out of love or like that, you know, that there, this is just one frequency that we're on and there are so many others. Um, and the information that we have here is so incomplete. Yeah. Um, so I love dealing with matters of, of ultimate concern. And I do think that that, like that morning routine, like that, you know, we like at Mudwater, right. We're talking, we talk a lot about like the morning ritual, the evening ritual. I do think that those times of day of like rising and resting are moments when you're remembering, they can be moments when you're remembering to deal with the matters of ultimate concern. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, this idea of, of ritual as um, the acts which we do that are known to get us ready for a world of unknowns. So, so to set, to set in motion a series of practices, but be it, you know, the ritual of marriage, the ritual of, you know, marriage is a ritual that happens before the great unknown of actually being married. Right. Right. But we ritualize this thing. And, and I think that's super powerful. We're, we're preparing ourselves for the world of unknowns by defining, by, by creating some definitions and some intentionality 
and behind the day is our is our morning ritual so like you're creating some intentionality behind the day there's a bit of dropping in perhaps like i love meditation certainly a part of mine breath works a part of mine i know those are part of yours as well and the idea of of kind of dropping into the soup and saying like okay who am i today all things are possible i intend a few things i'm going to draw in some specific energy that I believe to be Chris's energy for today, which is like, I'm going to, I'm going to treat people well. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to, um, I'm going to get some shit done that I'm excited about. And then launch yourself into the day of unknowns with that, you know, samurai sword polished the Kyle sword. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we're talking about consolidating power and how, when you are so like, when Chris is Chris is Chris, he becomes infinitely powerful. And yes, th- yes. <laughs> <laughs> he becomes Tony Robbins. Yeah. <laughs> As <laughs> breathe, people. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Coming 2022. <laughs> Tony Robbins. As Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> He'd make a good Godzilla. Tony Robbins would make a great Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we use these phrases like like tap in we use you know calling in uh which sort of oh, getting speaks now. to yeah. speaks to being portals of of energy that can make us crazy powerful yes. send us on tra- on trajectories and you are telling me that sometimes you'll have these moments where you're leading a breathwork class. Yeah. And something will happen to you. Yeah, yeah. So this thing is so cool because I think it's I think it translates to different things. It doesn't matter what you do. I think there's there's the the, the similar version of this that shows up. Um but in breathwork, the the experience the way it goes is I I guide people by by talking them through it like it's a challenging process and so the first few minutes are difficult so i'll just say things that kind of help people through and and i tend to just kind of try and shut down the the thinking mind and a little bit just let things come through you call that like channeling or you know tapping into the the main vein or you know the mycelial network of of whatever the communication is going on and you're just got an antenna picking it up that might sound crazy but we all do it all the time like where do your thoughts come from who knows like they just show up so you're just kind of letting those things come and, and letting them out, letting them out my mouth. Right. And at some point, the, these specific things come up to be said that inevitably come with a little bit of resistance and a little bit of fear around them because they're maybe a little weird. Like I'll say something like, and then you're thinking of your granddad in the canoe just slowly like r- rowing by, you know? And I'm like, how that, where the hell did that come from? Should I say that? That's weird that I got a hundred people here. They're in different experiences. Should I talk about a man in his canoe? Um, and I'll say it. I've challenged myself to whenever that weird thing comes, say it. Because inevitably what happens is after the experience, people come up and they want to share of their experience because they're so profound. And they'll say, someone will say, I was thinking of my granddad who used to canoe, you know, down the Delaware River and used to, you know, bring me cherries and whatever. And and it's the thing that I was scared to say or that I had a, a notable reaction to that's like, this is not mine. I don't know what this is, but man with canoe just came in. And again, getting a little at risk of being a little woo here. I, wait, 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 no, what was that? What's our new definition? I want to st- start training. At risk of this. dealing with matters of ultimate concern, I would say that I think the ultimate concern here, it, it deals with a collective, uh, a species that has great collective intelligence. We're human beings. We are, we are the best at creating community that has ever happened on earth. Like we are an incredible species of communality. And as evidenced by our civilizations and the way that we desperately crave to, to, to be part of groups and things like that. And so as such, we have like a really strong collective intelligence and awareness of what's going on collectively. Like honestly, that mycelial network that like we are connected. Mm -hmm. And so we have a collective subconscious. We have a collective understanding of what's going on here in the world. And it is really, 
when you are of service, when you are saying something that is, it's not, my, that's not mine. The, the guy with the canoe is not for me to hear. It's for me to say because another node on the network needs to hear it. And whatever that collective soup is, for whatever reason, I'm saying that thing, that person's picking it up. But the human organism, there's some available intelligence there where these things get shared. And to be a part of it, to be a contributing you know, voice to that, to that collective voice feels really good. And that's when we feel like we're in flow. That's when we're painting the thing that's like, I don't know where it came from, the genius of the song coming through, or even just like a freaking sick spreadsheet that you made. Right. It's just like, I don't know where that came from, but that thing is sick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, I like the trigger that you're tapping into, whether it's the like, am I going to give this guy's big gulp back to him? <laughs> Because there's a little resistance here, yeah. But I'm gonna do it right now. Yeah. But and it's different than b- belligerent difficulty, mm. right? I think that there's there are people who don't have they don't have that dial finely tuned, mm. and they're just kind of oh, I'm gonna do whatever. I have no fear, and that's not it. Yeah. But it's also not living timidly. Like it's like f- finely tuning your radio dial so that you can give the big gulp back and there's a conflict but there's also love in it or it's when the idea comes through you and you're like "Ooh, this is a little uncomfortable to say right now but i'm going to say it because that's the frequency that it's on i do think that it's a muscle that you can grow and you can start to get better at it the more you do the more you stop the less inward you become kind of by definition you're opening up and you're getting these thoughts that are coming in somewhere else and i think that that's how you see people who are on these crazy trajectories because they are more often open to that portal mm. uh I, and you know you could take this way back down to the way that andrew huberman talks about learning this is probably the most important thing that i've learned from from dr andrew huberman is that when you feel that moment of agitation or frustration, neurologically, that's actually the gateway to growth because you're feeling this little bit of acetylcholine that is dumping in your brain, which allows for neuroplasticity. So if we were to reframe our relationship with agitation as positive and a gateway to growth, Mm. I think that we would see a much different world. Mm -hmm. Man, that's it. That's it. And then, and then, and then to, to ask questions that put you in that place of it, how, how can I, how can I serve here? How can I be helpful? What are the, you know, to ask good questions truly that involve the, the, the collective, like what would be useful? I, I, I think on social media, sometimes that's a good question to ask. Is this helpful? Like what you're posting and who is it helpful to? It's like, could this be is this delightful? I mean, that's fine. It doesn't have to be always be helpful. Is this funny? Like, is this, or is this, or is this like, you know, potentially alienating, isolating? Is this, uh, aspirational? You know, you put a picture of your, your hot muscled Kyle, you know, eight pack on, on Instagram. (laughs) Who's that helping? Who's that? Nobody wants to see that, but yes, (laughs) some people do because it's aspirational. And some people are going to feel less than when they see that. And you don't, you're not ultimately in control of that. Right. But what you are in control is of your intentionality in doing it. And do you feel clear on that? you feel like you feel good about it? Does it feel good in your body to post it? If not, don't do it. If, if it does, do it. Right. Yeah, I think there's a huge power in making fun of yourself. That's, to me, I think that, like, the, uh, you know, when you decide to take take that chance and you fall flat on your face because if you feel the moment of fear and and agitation and then what you say comes stumbling out which it often will right it's not always you're not always hit with the the summer lightning strike of divinity and verbal fluidity when you have that little moment of agitation sometimes you're like good that didn't work out well like oops but (laughs) but you do get closer like there if you can have a sense of humor about making about kind of punching through that stratosphere again and again you your dial does become more finely tuned and you start to use words on yourself like i'm the kind of person that punches through a difficult situation or will say the potentially awkward thing because it feels true and you'll start to do it more and more and you'll become more um 
I think that your batting average begins to improve over time. I just saw this movie, Shang-Chi. It's so good. Hmm. It's the new Marvel movie. And, um, it's, there's, there's a line in the movie. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit nothing. You know, it's just, just an archer and she's aiming at the target. And to think about, you know, if we, if we do start to aim at something, whatever that may be, you just say like, you're going to fuck up. You're going to hit like so many, you're going <laughs> to yeah. miss so many times. But if you're aiming at something and that, and that's not like, that could be pretty simple. That could be like, I want to, I want to be, you know, I want to be of service. I want to be somebody who's, who's helping the world or I want to be an entertainer or I want to be, you know, whatever it is. Um, you'll start to hit it. Right. Like, and it, and life takes time and patience and our culture does not teach that. Our culture teaches us if you're not famous by the time you're 25, you're, you know, expiring. And I, I believe in the arc of a good life is one of like, you know, it's just an uphill slant that just goes up and then you just firework at 95 years old, you know? So it just keeps getting better because it keeps getting deeper in the experience of living. That's a good arc. That's an arc, arc worth shooting for. You know, that's aspirational to me. Given I'm 42, I'm over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a spring chicken, man. Got a lot, of, a lot ahead of us. I had a thought when you're... Um, yeah, I had lots of thoughts. This one passed me by. What else you got? That one passed you by. <laughs> I think that we end on that flub, actually. That's fine. We've, yeah, we've been we've been dancing seamlessly this whole yeah. time, and I think that ending on on your your flub oh, is perfectly. perfect. Yeah, Chris Keener, this was such a blast. Where can people get in touch with you? Kile Tierman. Um, you can get a hold of me on Instagram at the Chris Keener. That's a good place to do it. And I, I post a lot of breathwork stuff on there. So you can do a breathwork experience. Also, I have an app that's called the Lixir app, L-I-X-I-R A-P-P. You can download that and you can do breathwork at home anytime. It's free. Check it out. Try it out. Enjoy it. Uh, leave us a review if you're motivated to. I'd love to hear how that is for you. And lastly, at drinkmudwater.com. That's our show. If you enjoyed it, please give it a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. It takes about 60 seconds and it really does help. So thank you to everyone who is giving this show a rating. You can go to trendswithbenefits.com to check out all of our written work. It's where Sarah does a lot of her writing. It's where I do a lot of my writing. All over there at trendswithbenefits.com. It's also where you can sign up for our newsletter. Every week, we send out just one newsletter with our favorite story. And uh, it's fun. It's funny. It's meant to just bring a little bit of delight into your Friday. goes out to a few hundred thousand people and has some of the highest open rates out there, we're happy to say. So you can do that at trendswithbenefits.com. If you have feedback on this podcast, you can reach out to us on Instagram at drinkmudwtr. Or you can email us at podcast at mudwtr.com. That's also where you can send the voice memos. Just bust out your phone. Don't overthink it. Let us know who you are, how you like taking your mud water, and send that voice memo to podcast at mudwtr.com. And include your address, please. Um, We need your address. And if we play the voice memo at the beginning of this podcast, we will send you a free mud water mug. So thanks to everyone who is uh, sending those little voice memos in. We love getting them from you. All right, that's it. Get out in the world. Have a beautiful day. And thank you for your time and attention. I do not take it.